This drive shaft safety loop prevents it so the drive shaft doesn't go all the way down and catapult the car. Hey, real quick before we start this video, a lot of you guys have been asking for team shirts. Finally, Auto House has t-shirts, so it would really help out a lot if you supported the shop, got some merch, some shirts, stickers, support the media work, support me and my dog. Check out that merch store so I don't starve, you guys. Cars real big, TRD real big, progress real big. Let me tell you how we live. All right, and we're back. Big progress, also big tired. Again, big news, this is coming really close. I just got a call from the wire harness guy. Wire harness should be done by next Saturday at the latest. And we're just waiting on small parts at this point. So why don't we go check it out. Fuel system's plumbed. We're using the stock fuel pulsation dampener. If you cut off those crimp on fittings, they just become a hose barb. So I have dash six AN hose and the proper fuel injection clamp. Our feed line goes directly. We got a brand new OEM Toyota fuel filter. Again, just cut off the hose crimp. And same thing, the other end of our Dash 6 AN hose and the proper fuel injection clamp. Dash 6 AN is really close to the OEM 516th. So yeah, this will work out really well. On the return side, typically looks like this. M12 by 1.25 thread. We got the proper banjo, again to Dash 6 AN. Go all the way over here. Fuel pressure regulator on the return side. The vacuum port's not needed. On bottom, we have a quarter inch to go to the OEM quarter inch return line. So this, this bottom fitting is a dash six AN ORB to quarter inch barb. I ended up finding that from an eBay seller who sells LS swap parts. So yeah, that fitting was pretty hard to find. So yeah, go figure. Vibrant performance has been my go-to for AN fittings. I know there's some higher quality ones like XRP, but I've played with a lot, a lot of different company fittings and uh, Vibrant's been, you know, forget affordable, Vibrant's just been like the best overall for me as far as um, hose assembly and then, you know, not leaking on me at the end or not having to do some like crazy procedure to get these AN fittings not to leak. So yeah, go Vibrant. Beam swap coil radiator from Battle Garage. Coil radiator, why don't you just provide a radiator cap? This is really ridiculous. So we're using the customer's OEM radiator cap from the 4AG radiator. Thank you, Chris Van, showing me the excessive radiator shroud and radiator fan. All around this, we have uh, foam because you want the airflow to go through the radiator, not out up through the sides of this fan shroud. So yeah, absolutely critical to put foam all around this fan shroud. JSP thermostat outlet. It baffles me how popular this swap is, how many people have done the swap, yet so much of this is undocumented, right? So I realize depending on what engine mounts and what position you put the engine in, your radiator hoses are gonna be different. But man, I can't find any concrete data on what radiator hoses people are using. So from HPS, we got the full silicone AE86 radiator and heater hose kit on the way. Um, we had some mock-up hose and I think the factory AE86 hose is gonna work for our beam setup. We're gonna keep heater in this car. Again, there's one three quarter outlet from the heater where it's that line that SQ tells you to cut off. And I have a few solutions for that. So I sourced what's apparently called a heater hose adapter. This is three quarter to five eighths. Uh, we may end up using this, but the other thing I found out was that 5A silicone hose actually has enough play in it to go around a three quarter. So when I did the beam swap refresh with uh, Corner Balance Grand Mighty, are we clear over here? To convert the three quarter coolant hose on the back of the head, he had a section of silicone 5A hose, and that's what we ended up using to the 5 8 heater core fittings. Again, A86 problems. These are severe on back order, so. I asked the owner to bring back his old one so we can at least mock up the cooling system. Excessive throttle bracket, if you notice, it's painted black now. And also I added this reinforcement. Just to recap, this adapts the OEM A86 non-cruise throttle cable to the factory beams throttle body. When we first function tested this, this bent a whole lot. So um, I added this reinforcement on the top in hoping that this wouldn't bend, but I'll show you guys, unfortunately that's not gonna be the case.
So yeah, even with the reinforcement on that excessive throttle bracket, you can see it bends a whole bunch still. I bet you if that thing was made out of billet aluminum, it wouldn't bend like that. But yeah, I told, I showed the customer, he knows we're gonna run this in the meantime. Priority number one is to get this swap running and tuned and then we'll clean up all the rest. But yeah, not too happy even after that reinforcement, but it's gonna work for now. Let's see. Brake booster hose. Just a regular piece of 3 8 hose to the brake booster check valve. Our vacuum line to the EVAP canister right there just so happens to be. There's an EVAP VSV, two lines off of it. And it just so happens that that line has a little bracket right there. And it just so happens to end up in the perfect spot for the factory EVAP canister vacuum port. Yeah, we probably didn't mention too that we have the EVAP canister bolted in. It's actually just taking the bracket off of the EVAP canister, turning it upside down, and bending the tabs a little bit. It actually bolts up in the exact same spot. So what do we have inside here? So this beautiful boy shift knob ends up being pretty sentimental to the owner. Luckily we were able to find it. In the piece de resistance, the JSP reverse lockout shifter. So pretty interesting, we're using the JSP engine and transmission mounts. If you can see there's a hump here, this actually this trans tunnel actually did not clear the engine and trans mounts. We actually had to basically clearance up this section right near here. And even that wasn't enough. And I'll show you underneath. We actually spaced down the transmission mount with about, with like three millimeter washers. And so, uh, yeah, our issue, I believe, was third and then first gear, the the rear portion of the JSP relocation shifter would actually, uh, there's two Allens and they would hit against this trans tunnel. So um, that was our clearance issue, but no big deal. Not a huge amount of modification and, uh, and the factory shift boot should still bolt up and fit on top of this guy. More goodies under the car. Why don't we go take a look? All right, so with a one piece drive shaft, you absolutely need a drive shaft safety loop. And I will link the video in the description below. This drive shaft safety loop prevents it so the drive shaft doesn't go all the way down and catapult the car. So yeah, one more time, absolutely required. If you have a one piece drive shaft, you need a drive shaft safety loop. You can see the marks up there where we had to clearance it out for the back of the JSP relocation shifter in order to go into first and third. The amount of clearancing wasn't actually enough, but I didn't want to destroy the body too much or modify the body too much. So if you look closely, those are about three millimeter spacers and we spaced the actual transmission mount down itself to allow for room for the shifter. Actually, not that bad of an idea because the more you space the transmission mount down, the less extreme the pinion angle actually gets. So not that bad. Um, I know this exhaust is ugly as hell. People on Instagram have constantly DM'd me like what the hell's going on with this exhaust, but trust me, we're getting something way nicer before we get this swap running. The OEM Alteza Clutch Slave, the outlet is like that. On a 886, the outlet is more like, like that bleeder right there. What does that mean? Your OEM line is gonna be too short. And I found out a long time ago that you just need a longer section of line. So right here, we're using a front brake line off an A86 to act as the clutch line. I have the same thing on my personal car, which is J160 to 4AG. But yeah, you need a longer line for that clutch slave. Yeah, one more time, how low this oil pan hangs down in comparison to the subframe. Um, I'm really close to telling the owner that he needs to raise up this car because he likes to run his car super low. Yeah, so low in fact that when we lower the lift, his wheels actually don't touch the ground. <laughs> so my biggest challenge, I think I talked about it in part one, creating the bottom part of the header for this vehicle. I ended up getting this two and a half section from Vibrant Performance. So it's already pre-bent. I actually am not a fabricator. I don't have any fabrication tools. I don't have a bandsaw, don't have a tubing vendor. So, <laughs> so doing my best and kind of challenging myself building this header. Um, you can see I got some pieces cut already from previously. Um, I found this Y section. So two inch slit fit to two and a half inch outlet. These two and a half inch flanges are from Summit Racing. And pretty cool, this thing came with a bung for O2 sensor also. So I found this for a steal on eBay, which completely worked for us and super lucky. I'm going to weld in some slip, like some slip fit springs or something, just like the Martellius headers have. 
So yeah, I got the first runner slip fit in there. And yeah, last night I got the first runner completed. Um, again, it's not the prettiest thing, nor am I the prettiest person in the world, but it will certainly work. Also very nicely clears the steering shaft and hugs the side of the frame rail nicely. Also without contacting the underside of the chassis and melting your vans on the floor. <laughs> So yeah, I'm pretty sure that's the bulk of the updates. It may not seem a lot, but yeah, behind the scenes, a ton of work, even more research, and even more time adjusting, getting things to fit. Um, no swap is gonna be 100% bolt in. Um, I am absolutely learning this with the beam swap, which I thought was bolt in, you know, with all the support, but yeah, still a lot of stuff you gotta piecemeal together. But yeah, definitely home stretch. Again, that harness, the the wire harness guy called me. We should be having the harness by fr Saturday, by next Saturday at the latest. So that's going to be exciting, but that's also going to push the team to, me and the team, to get this thing ready. I'm pumped. The owner was like, hey, you need to work slower so I can make more payments. <laughs> but, but yeah, um, overall, man, I'm excited as hell, not only to see this thing run, but to, you know, drive around. Yeah, there seems to have been a really good response to the end of the first beams video, which I chopped up and made a, to its own a dedicated video about why I typically don't like to take custom work and I 99.9% .9 of the time absolutely will not take swaps. You know, a lot of the times I would say all the work you see doesn't make it onto YouTube. All the trials, tribulations, problems you run into, whether that be like parts, financial, customers, that all doesn't make it into YouTube. I guess one thing I'll bring up is that a lot of unqualified people worked on this car before and we had to fix a lot of their mistakes. And I mean, just an, ex an example, a simple front wheel bearing job on this car ended up turning into a absolute nightmare. And uh, we'll kind of just <clears throat> walk through it. So. Wheel bearings, right? Uh, the wheels, especially the passenger side wheel, I could pretty much like, like no preload at all. We did the wheel bearings. One of the races was broken in half. One of the races spun, which means it wasn't slit fit in the wheel bearing hub anymore. Ugh. Let's go check it out. Ah, here we go. Yeah, check it out. This is the inside wheel bearing race. Um, I do not even know what happened, but we, when I told Michael to pound out the races, this is how we found them. No need to pound these out, so what the hell. Clean, packed, repaired the hub, re-greased, preloaded the wheel bearings, and lo and behold, the, the hubs don't spin. So half the hardware in the calipers were missing. Both of these brake brackets were bent one way or the other, so the caliper actually contacted the rotor. So yeah, bent the caliper brackets back, but wait, there's more before all of that, I found this amazing discovery. Yeah, if you check out this spindle, it looks like the other guy, I don't know what the hell he did, but he put a cutoff wheel to this spindle. And I don't know if the bearing spun or what at one time, but you can tell some serious damage happened there and then he ended up cutting it off and then not preloading the bearings at all. I bet you because the caliper brackets were, either he bent them or they were bent and the rotor couldn't turn. You know, as a Mickey Mouse fix, he just reduced the preload on the bearings so that the rotor could finally move freely and, you know, turn somewhat. This is just about as hack as it gets. You know, excuse the cliche, you get what you pay for. You definitely get what you pay for. You know, some shops charge a higher hourly rate for a reason, right? Because you have the skills, experience, and knowledge, and maybe the team and the facilities to work on whatever specialty projects you have. There's a reason why some people cost so much. And another thing, there's reasons why they're specialists, right? I mean, I'll just give you an example. I do a lot of pre and post vehicle inspections. I had a long time good customer just bought a E30 BMW that was lightly modified. Had a lot of issues. The owner was not very honest with that car. Had a ton of issues. And basically he asked me for a quote on, you know, how much I would charge if I were to do the work. And I, I basically told him, right? Like, I bet you there is someone local who knows these cars better than I do, maybe charges less than I do, and probably specializes in, in the E30 chassis, probably has worked on them all his life. That's the guy you should actually be going to, not 
paying me to relearn a whole different chassis. Although in one way that's like, that's money in your pocket, why don't you take it? Well, you know, a lot of times I, I gotta balance this risk versus reward where it's like, I could stretch myself and stretch mine and the shop's abilities on the work we take, but there's a lot of times where it's like, we're probably not the right shop or people to do to do this particular specialty job and have the expectation that you want right e30 bmw there's probably a dude who lives breathes and bleeds e30 that's probably the guy to take it to probably not me <laughs> again just to simply sum it up honesty transparency setting expectations and you know having that trusting relationship with a customer whether it's me telling the customer 100 percent we're able to do it or hey, there's probably someone or a shop that's much better suited to meet the expectations that you want. Another mouthful monologue, but I appreciate you guys joining me on the journey. We're gonna go ahead and continue our grind on this next week. Maybe next time we film, we'll have a running car. That's very possible. So thank you for all the support, questions, comments. You wanna make fun of me, it's all good. Leaving it in the comments below. Appreciate all the support as always. Catch you guys next time.